All right, it's, uh, it's 9.45, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Thomas Bachman, I work for the Noir Networks Group of Cisco. Um, uh, this talk, or this, this session, it's not really a talk, is, is um, exploring use of Docker, Vagrant, and other things um, in open daylight infrastructure. And um, so, uh, just as kind of a background, I, I kind of, this, this, this session was kind of selfish in nature for me because um, you know, we had some needs for testing for our project, and then the more I started thinking about it, I realized, well, this is really kind of a lot of projects within Open Daylight are going to have the same problem. So basically, the issues are, you know, as projects are maturing, the test setups and the requirements are becoming more sophisticated. We have um, clustered data store testing. We have data, more sophisticated data plane validation. Um, we have, you know, it just sort of currently the way we currently do testing. It requires more nodes with each node having an incremental cost of RAM and CPUs and stuff. Um, the number of projects in open daylight is increasing. I mean, we had 23 in helium, we have 42 in lithium, beryllium, you know, we don't know yet how many projects are going to be, um, but it's something we need to kind of think about as things moving forward. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, it, maybe Andy can correct me, we have 256 slaves, is that correct? Uh, Okay. And is it 1.5 terabytes? terabytes? Okay. And we had to bump that up recently because of... So, you know, this is just, just projecting about, you know, what we have today and where we're going. And so, um, you know, we can add more infrastructure, but what's the cost and, you know, what kind of trajectory are we on? So, you know, what can we do? Um, you know, we do some things are perhaps easier than others that we can look at, like we can try and minimize Jenkins jobs by reducing ex ex test execution times. Um, that may, makes it the job queue less because the jobs are taking less and if a bunch of jobs spin up, you know, you, they, they're retiring faster so you don't have as long a queue. And sometimes that's a problem because people are trying to push through commits and they're waiting for a big backlog of jobs to get through, so it's nice to have that, that, that shorter execution times. You can create more scalable tests, um, tests that you know, are gonna, you know are gonna as you, they mature and you add more sophistication to them that it's not gonna completely tear down your, your testing infrastructure. Um, you can create a framework for doing more sophisticated test setups. Like it'd be nice to have that where you can have, whether it's, whether it's a Docker container or a Vagrant setup or what it is that you can, that you can, has functionality already in it that you can use. And that, Cause there'll be, I think there'll be commonalities across projects for, for certain testing requirements. And so one of the things, my goal, and I don't think we're going to solve all these today, my goal with this session was to try and, um, try and come up with a list of action items that we can go off and do that, you know, and investigate. Because we have to, I think some of this is going to take some investigation. You know, what can we really do with Docker? What can we do in terms of improving the execution times? What can we do with the test setups that, to improve these things? So that's, that's my, if, it's, if we come out of this session with just some of those action items, I'll, that's, that's, I'll be happy. Um, so for those of you who are familiar, today's infrastructure, we, um, we, could, we will spin up multiple instances for like clustering tests with JClouds, um, and the data plane tests are usually typically a, a single node with Mininet, and so it's a you know, somewhat limited um, topology, and Mininet has its own limitations about what kind of data path testing you can do, um, and so you, you know, we ideally like more um, sophistication in terms of, of scaling for clustered, uh, Set, test setups, more sophistication for what we can test with data plane setups, uh, more control over these kinds of things. And so, that's, so these are some of the things we need to investigate. Um, so in terms of test execution, um, there are some easy things we can do. We can, uh, I was talking with Tan and he's like, well, you know one thing, the controller right now has, you know, takes a while to, to, to complete and that's mainly because you build it and then through, as part of the build, you're running a lot of these unit tests and there might be a, a speed up you can have of just the build, or if you could build it first and do that and do the test separately, you can separate these things and you might actually be able to, to, to have some benefits from that, uh, depending on like when a test fails versus when you know something in the build fails, relatively speaking. So, oh, apparently I'm, <laughs> here we go, go back to presentation mode here. Okay, so there may be some easy things we can do just in terms of how we are running things in terms of tests. Um, that's just one example. Um, and maybe Docker can be used to improve 
test times, for example, we discovered that with uh, the current setup, um, if you're spinning up multiple instances for a test, you have to, it, the way the, the API currently works, you have to wait for the first instance to come all the way up before you can then spin up the other instances. So if we can have something where you have a containerized solution, it all comes up in one, one, one VM and you can have these containers that come up with it so you're not, you're not par you can paralyze it within the VM as opposed to waiting you know, serially for the VMs. Um, there may be other things we can do. Uh, there, this, some of this may be moot because there, there were, there's plans to move to node pool, um, but it's still worth, I think, investigating some of these options. Uh, in terms of sophistication, we can also look at using containerized data planes. Um, there may be issues that we need to investigate, I think, with using um, open vSwitch in, with Docker containers on a VM, and, and that's one of the, some of the things, action items I'd like to have come out of this is to, you know, we can figure out potential issues and whether or not they're solvable and whether or not we're getting benefit from some of this. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the things to look at. Um, another item that's come up with, uh, within the community, and I think it's gonna come up more and more as we have more integrations is um, OpenStack. I know that, that we wanna have voting on changes whenever there are commits upstream in OpenStack. We wanna make sure that we, you know, that our integrations still work um, we'd like to get more sophisticated with our integrations, like we'd have to more sophisticated data plane tests and verification. I mean, it's one thing just to verify that the REST calls come down and work okay, but you'd also like to make sure that your NetVert solution, with whoever it is, VTN, GBP, OVSDB, that that still works as well. Um, and so I'm not sure if you know, Docker or any of these things are going to, to improve that, but it's something I think we should at least look at. And then just, I we'll also want to open it to the audience for other ways that people can think of for, um, for improving the test environment. So, um, so that's, that's, those are my big things for, the, for this part of this. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Gary. He's gonna talk a little bit more about um, Docker. And then after that, we'll kind of open it up to you guys because I'd like to, to get input on this subject from, and ideas from everyone so we can then get a list of ideas. Maybe I'll put them on a, the, uh, the easel over there and we can come up with a list of things that we'd like to go off and investigate uh, at the end of the session. So I'll go ahead. And Great, hi everyone, uh, my name is Gary Wu, I'm with Huawei. Um, so my experience and perspective is slightly different from Tom's. Um, I was mainly uh, interested in testing the cl ODL clustering performance and uh, functionality. So uh, it was very natural that uh, I started exploring things like uh, VirtualBox and uh, Docker in particular to be able to spin up and down uh, clusters. Um, particularly because I was doing a lot of things like uh, testing different number of nodes in a cluster. Um, so I basically put together a little bit of uh, uh, information here to share with everybody on my experiences and, and I'm by no means an expert in Docker itself. So uh, maybe some of the issues I ran into, some, um, some of you folks in the audience will be able to actually uh, pitch in as well. Okay, um, so um, for those of you who are not familiar, Vagrant is a tool for basically managing virtual machines. Uh, and I think by default, Vagrant uses uh, vir VirtualBox as its virtual machine provider. Um, and it has good facilities for uh, basically specifying uh, consistent configuration for each of the nodes in a cluster. You can tell Vagrant to spin up uh, as many nodes as you want for whatever testing uh, you would like to do. Um, so this is a, a quick uh, basically agenda list of what I'm covering today. Uh, I'll, I'll just let you read through that and I'll just jump into it. So um, the first thing that I'm doing is essentially um, uh, uh, later on uh, you'll see that basically I'm relying on the integration repository in ODL that has a deploy script for deploying basically ODL instances to cluster nodes. So a lot of my exercise was basically in uh, properly setting up the cluster nodes up front in the first place. And I'm not actually using the ODL integration Jenkins infrastructure for that testing. This is actually running on my local machine. So um, I'm, just, I'm describing basically how I'm setting up my local machine. And a lot of these, like, uh, if you are familiar, um, I, I don't want to go into too much details of that. That's redundant. So um, but basically, I'm using Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, I set up Vagrant, latest version. Uh, I set up Docker, latest version, uh, using the basically the default installation. Uh, instructions from their respect, respective websites. Um, 
And one last thing that I had to basically figure out was actually setting up DNS mask to ensure that I can configure the node names and have it be visible to all the cluster nodes uh, that I'm spinning up. Um, and this was because I found that with, at least with Docker and Vagrant, I'm not able to specify the static IPs, whereas with VirtualBox, it's very easy to, to specify the static IPs for each of the nodes that you're bringing up. So I ended up having to use DNS masks to basically uh, derive the IP addresses that got created as they're booting up. Okay, hopefully people can read this. Um, so Vagrant essentially uh, depends on a, what they call a Vagrant file, which is a configuration file for specifying the configuration of the virtual machine that you want to spin up. Um, and Vagrant by itself actually ha supports a uh, Docker virtual machine provider. Um, so as, a, as I said before, Vagrant by default uses VirtualBox, um, but they are really virtual machine agnostic. So you can actually choose what virtual, ma virtual machine provider you want to use. Uh, and Docker is not really a virtual machine, but uh, Vagrant has uh, basically added the capability to be able to use Docker to spin up instances, as you were. So um, since I'm often, uh, we may often need to spin up multiple nodes that are the same configuration, it makes sense to use Vagrant to control Docker in this case. Um, so uh, roughly speaking, um, what we're doing here, so uh, the Vagrant files are actually basically Ruby files. Here you see on top of the script, I'm actually specifying the number of uh, nodes that I would like to spin up. And I'm looking through, I'm looping through the number of nodes and then specifying the configuration for each VM. Uh, and in particular, you'll see uh, for each VM, I'm specifying the, the node number. Uh, let's see if I can get the cursor up here. So I'm giving the, the host name to Docker, essentially. And then what the Docker instance is actually doing is, um, if you're familiar with Docker, you would normally specify a particular command that you would like, like to run within the, command, uh, the container. Uh, and then after the command is executed, it returns control back to your host machine. So um, this is, I don't want to do that. Um, I want to actually have the container to remain running and accept commands. So the setup is essentially that the command that I'm running in Docker is actually sshd um, and have it remain in the foreground so that once this command returns, um, it actually will basically keep the SSD session open so that I can later connect to it using SSH directly instead of having to do everything through the initial Docker command line prompt. Um, and that, then the very last line here, um, so this per first part is I'm specifying that um, all the Docker containers should use this particular machine, which is my host machine IP address, um, to do the name resolution. So this allows me, uh, basically allows each of the cluster nodes to be able to contact the other cluster nodes using their, the names I'm specifying. Uh, in this case, D node zero through two, D node zero, D node one, D node two. Um, and then the, the next configuration here is because I actually want to uh, somehow restrict the number of CPUs that each container is using so I can better grasp of the performance characteristics. Um, okay, um, this is the sample Docker file that I end up using. Um, so the Docker file essentially is you can think of it like an initializ initialization script for the, the container. Um, I would like each Docker instance just to boot up with various things already installed. Um, so on the very top, it's pretty uh, simple. I'm installing OpenSSH, I'm op installing OpenJDK, and also unzip just so I can unzip the, uh, the ODL binary. Um, and then some of these, in particular this section here, no, thanks, Tom. Um, if you're not familiar with Vagrant, uh, Vagrant by default handles a lot of things using SSH, um, which means that you need to set up your containers correctly in, able to, in order to allow you yourself or other tools to connect into the container using SSH. Um, and the way that Vagrant does this is that they come shipped with a default what they call the insecure public key. And that's the default key that Vagrant system will try to detect to see if you have 
properly installed uh, a key for the Vagrant system to access. And once they find it, they will actually, um, they have, you have the option to actually have that re replaced and recreated with something that is secure. Um, and then so Vagrant can actually generate secure keys for you for each of the containers. Um, but you need to put this insecure key up front first for them to detect it. Um, so then after this, uh, you can use the Vagrant SSH commands to con connect to the individual containers if you need to. Okay, um, so this last part is basically something that I whipped up myself, which is, uh, again, like I was describing, uh, with, at least with Docker, I did not figure out how to boot up a container and have it and specify a fixed IP address for each node. So I, I have to basically rely on the Docker system to spin the nodes up, uh, and then I run a set of commands to basically find out what was the IP address that was generated for each node. And then I create this uh, name, name and IP address mapping to a configuration file called Docker container host, and I make sure that I have this host file added in the DNS mask configuration. Um, so this in combination with the fact that I'm specifying uh, the use of the host as the name server uh, allows the host as well as all the individual cluster nodes to be able to talk to each other via the names as opposed to the numeric IPs. Okay, so um, all that's said and done, basically you, have, you will have spun up a set of, let's say, three Docker containers um, that actually don't have ODL on them. Um, so by default, they just have Java. Uh, and then what I'm using is that um, in the ODL integration repository uh, under this directory, um, the, the cluster deploy directory, there's actually a deploy script, and I, I believe this is the same script that the, uh, the ODL Jenkins infrastructure uses to deploy. Um, so the, the fundamental assumption there is that, um, at least for, for this particular testing scenario, um, it's likely that every time you're deploying, the binary is different, right? So the script was created essentially to always start by copying a binary distribution file that you specify into the nodes that are now freshly sort of booted up. So it's always assumed that the, the nodes are fresh and clean so that you have reproducible uh, environments. And it copies, copies in whatever binary you are testing right now, and it unzips it and just runs it directly. Um, this is the same one that I'm using as well. Uh, and later on, I'll open it up for maybe possible optimizations if this is not the particular flow that you're testing. Um, um, and then likewise, there's a, a monitor script for monitoring the status of the, cl the clusters. And on the bottom, you see a sort of a sample output for what that cluster monitor script shows. Um, and this was actually pretty helpful in basically being able to see whether the cluster nodes themselves have actually booted and started correctly. Um, I, I'm finding that it takes uh, maybe around three minutes or so for each node to come up. So, um, so sometimes you're not really sure like when you can start doing any sort of testing, uh, rest console, stuff, whatnot. So this is a, a very useful script to, to have. Uh, and it actually shows you for each of the shards uh, who is the leader, who is the follower. Okay, um, so a little bit on the observations that I have uh, on running basic audio cluster nodes uh, in Docker versus VirtualBox. So um, first off, the Docker containers start and uh, actually they start up much, much faster. Uh, and this is primarily because in using VirtualBox, you have to wait for the entire virtual machine and operating system to boot up, which itself could take a couple minutes per environment. Um, and then so when you start doing things like, let's say you want to test a 20 node cluster, that time really starts to add up. Whereas um, the instance startup for Docker, it's, it's in a matter of seconds. So, um, Oh, so uh, the way Docker works is that um, when you install like all those things like that, the first time it does the install and then it snapshots the resulting file system. So in the future, when you boot up a Docker container of the same configuration, it's actually smart enough to not redo the whole thing. It just grabs a snapshot from the previously, uh, grabs a copy of the previously snapshot of the uh, file system. So uh, when you, Basically, that uh, expense is only incurred once initially. Uh, 
and there, thereafter, no matter how many nodes you start up, it actually is almost instantaneous, like seconds. Um, so, but that, that's a very good point. Uh, if you have to do this with VirtualBox, then the VirtualBox initialization script will literally uh, do the app get and download the whole Java binary and then install it, and that itself takes a lot, a lot longer than uh, even just uh, the VM startup as well. Um, one of the downsides I found with uh, Docker was that uh, it is harder to configure the, the network versus VirtualBox. Um, the first thing I mentioned already before was that uh, whereas in VirtualBox, it's very to, easy to specify the static IP for each of the VMs that you're booting up. With Docker, um, at least I have not been able to find a way to do it. So I ended up doing this almost like a workaround using the DNS mask. Um, but perhaps if someone knows uh, how to do that with Docker, um, definitely please uh, jump in. Um, and then the other downside was that um, at least uh, as far as I'm aware, the, the networking stack of configuration of Docker is a little less flexible compared to VirtualBox. Uh, with VirtualBox, it's very easy to say, I want to expose each VM as its own new IP address on the same local network, for example, uh, on the host machine. So then you can do things like um, make connections to individual nodes from outside the host machine to the individual nodes. Uh, whereas with Docker, it doesn't seem to have the capability to do that at this point. Um, which means that when you're booting up a cluster using Docker and you want to connect to it, you pretty much have to connect to it from either within the host machine or from other Docker containers within the same host machine. Or you need to start doing things like um, port uh, forwarding and things like that. Um, but once you have 20, 30 nodes, um, it's really hard to manage all the different ports that each ODL instance has to expose. Because um, the ODL instance exposes like, I don't know, five or 10 different ports on all sorts of different things, right? So um, that turns out to be uh, pretty complicated. So, um, so Docker, like if you are able to live within this constraint, um, Docker is definitely much faster to start and run, um, but you can't connect to the individual nodes from the outside. Um, and the last thing I found was that, um, I, uh, in my testing at least, I wanted to uh, do various restrictions on the number uh, of resources that each node is using. Um, and particularly on the number of CPUs, where VirtualBox, uh, the configuration is pretty simple. You just say, okay, one CPU, two CPU, three CPUs, and then the uh, VirtualBox manager will take care of allocating f that for you. Um, in Docker right now, they deal primarily with CPU shares. So um, if you have 20 cores on your machine, um, it's not as easy to say, okay, I only want you to use just a single core. Um, the closest I could find in uh, Docker is essentially this concept called CPU sets, which is um, you explicitly uh, enumerate the cores of the host machine that you want each container to use. So uh, if that works for you, then great. Um, otherwise, um, it's a little bit more restricting. Okay, um, and here is uh, basically some issues that I found trying to use uh, Docker. Um, the, the first thing is that, so, so Vagrant up is basically the command that you use to bring up all the Vagrant uh, instances, sort of the VM instances. Uh, I did not figure out why this uh, is, but on occasion, especially when I'm starting a, a large number of old uh, Docker instances, uh, things will freeze. Um, you see all, the, basically, the, the output going through trying to initialize various uh, containers, but uh, it's just somehow gets stuck, whereas uh, normally it goes through like within seconds. Um, when that happens, control C out of it, now you have to basically bring down everything and a restart. Um, not sure exactly what was causing this, um, but this is, not, this is an issue that I did not observe with VirtualBox. Um, and the next thing was um, I've, I ran into a very strange issue on <coughs> running on Docker once I start uh, exceeding more than 30 ODL instances on the same host machine. Um, so I can start up, let's say, more than 50 Ubuntu-based instances, fine. I can connect to all of them and everything runs smoothly. Now as I go through and start booting up ODL instances in each of the containers, um, as I get pro progressively closer to around 30 or so, I start seeing strange network errors on the host machine, like pings start breaking, like uh, DNS resolution start breaking. 
um, but it's sort of sporadic. But as you start loading more and more ODL instances, then it becomes more and more persistent until after 30, 35, then it's almost, almost always fails. Uh, but then if I go through and start shutting down the number of nodes, then once I bring it down below 30, then everything magically recovers. Um, so this is a very strange issue. Um, if anyone has uh, run into anything like this, um, definitely uh, appreciate any insights you may have. Um, so, but because of this, that, that means that very uh, practically speaking, I was unable to do any sort of testing above the roughly the 30 node limits using Docker. Uh, whereas, again, on VirtualBox, did not have such an issue. Um, and the next point is actually not specific to Docker. Um, just a sort of general observation on running audio clusters is that um, it's very hard to determine when exactly the full audio cluster has actually completed initializing and is good for basically open for business. Um, and uh, among other things, I end up figuring out that uh, I, I end up having to check against each ODL instance what the CPU usage is. Um, so I observed that uh, during startup, roughly each node will go up to 100 or 200 percent CPU for a while and then settle down a little bit, spike a little bit, and then finally settle down to about maybe 20. 15, 20 percent. Um, but when you're on a multi-core system, like obviously not everything runs at the same time, so then I'm checking the CPU usage uh, and then making sure that it's actually stabilized um, before I start, start any sort of testing. Um, and the, the next thing I need to check is actually uh, whether the shard leaders have been elected. Um, there are occasions when, when you're doing, let's say, more than 10 nodes, um, it takes a long time for the leader to get elected. Um, I've seen it take as long as maybe five minutes uh, before the leader actually gets pegged to a particular node. Uh, but then it's not consistent. So um, then I end up having a, another script trying to detect, make sure that there's only a single leader that has been uh, elected for each shard. Um, and, and I can confirm that uh, I can start actually doing the, the next step. Um, i also seen cases where uh, CPU has stabilized, uh, shard leader has apparently been elected properly, um, but certain nodes, when you actually try to make a rest call, will just return 500. Um, and then the only, the only way to get rid of that is I end up having to terminate that particular instance and restart it, uh, and then sometimes it'll come back up normal, and sometimes I have to restart it again. Um, so like I said, so these are, um, not Docker specific. Um, these are also observed when I try to do it on VirtualBox. Um, so uh, basically, I end up having to do all these three tests before I can confirm that okay, the node, is, the cluster is actually fully up and running. Um, that, that said, uh, for the nodes that actually are running, uh, it, it seems to work fine when some of the nodes are not running. So um, I guess the the redundancy uh, high availability feature works. So. Okay, and, uh, and the last point is just um, just something else to bring up. Um, so again, I'm using the, the integration repository deploy script um, to basically deploy the images each time on a fresh instance, uh, which is great when you're always testing basically new code all the time, right? Um, but if you're, you have a scenario where you often want to actually test with the same ODL code, uh, it actually may make more sense to actually build your own Docker image and have ODL instance uh, directly already preloaded in it. So you don't even have to go through so that step. That's it. Great, thanks. Thanks, Gary. I, so at this point, I'm just going to, I was thinking I could just start with a Google document and uh, um, maybe I could, we could start throwing things in here for, um, just brainstorming on what we think we can do in t uh, for, um, uh, where is Google Docs? Um, what we can do, nice. Do we have, there we go. Um, well, uh, the, uh, I'd like to just kind of start, I mean, he, Gary pointed out a few issues uh, of using Docker, but uh, I could definitely see at least the benefit of using Docker with, um, with uh, clustering testing, and maybe we can look at uh, 
exploring some of those issues further. I've also talked with Ruzhing about uh, some of the data plane things, and, and so there's some stuff we can probably uh, maybe talk a little bit more about there. But um, uh, I, I guess also I should ask if others have thoughts on, um, here we go, come on. New Google Doc, and we'll call this, we've got what, 15, less than 15 minutes here? Let's see what we can do. Um, uh, testing in ODL Infra. Uh, I guess maybe first, I, now that we've done a lot of talking, I guess first I should open up to the audience. Are there any other things that people are aware of that we should be thinking about in terms of addressing these main issues of, of testing time, uh, scalability, uh, sophistication of data planes, um, anything that we haven't touched on with just Docker, Vagrant, and trying to think about other things that we can do in, o in the ODL infrastructure. Okay. Wait, so, so make, just to make sure I understand, and just so everyone can hear, so the, 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 you're, you're saying for verified jobs, is there some sort of dedicated setup that we can, that we can use? Is that, did I capture that correctly? I don't know. Yeah. Andy, did you want to? For those of you, I'm not saying that it's not doable. I'm not saying that it's actually possible. You could assume that the Docker containers are clean, and we do actually have a Docker instance in the slave environment already. Uh, the OSDB project is just for doing that validation. Uh, so we have Docker in the environment. Uh, it's just a matter of. 
Okay, I'll take that one. By the way, people feel free to edit this document. I put, uh, I put it on the um, Open Daylight Meeting IRC. I can put it in there again. But uh, if, if people don't hesitate to jump in and if you've got ideas, throw them in this document. We'll keep this a living community document uh, beyond this session. So it was, Jimmy, finish, finish your thoughts, sorry. You, you, Ruzhing, was, were, were you guys talk, working about the IP address? So we, we don't, there, it uses DHCP, but we're not in control of the DHCP, as we're uh, saying. They don't actually use the HTTP. What happens is we're at the RAC based out of known attack class. At least this has come up to actually in an IP address each each organization. Uh, on the chat, it hasn't come up. There is actually no DHCP running on those networks. So HTTP provider actually takes Okay. So, uh, and actually, I realized we're getting it down like five minutes. Um, probably with the remaining five minutes, the best thing I can do is just hit on some of the high-level things that we know we can that we can have people go out and investigate. One of which is maybe IP addressing for Docker, um, and I I will own that in terms of working with you know, how can we make this more externally visible, at least from our testing infrastructure perspective, uh, and still make all this work. Um, other items that we know we, we wanted to investigate, there was one, um, uh, maybe, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take this as well, talk to some of the controller committers about the possibility of splitting out the, um, the build and test, that we can maybe improve something there. But, uh, um, another one that might be interesting is, you've created, the, Gary, taken the time to create the, uh, the clustering testing locally maybe we can have we can have a few people investigate what it would take to um to stand that up in in integration whether whether or not that's even makes sense because uh, there are there are issues that will come up in terms of you know where we talk about the networking side of it but also just to flush out the other issues just just from the clustering perspective um uh, if anyone wants to jump in <laughs> Uh, time frame? Uh, I don't know how. I'm, I'm not gonna. I mean, if people are gonna. I mean, people aren't gonna do much probably today and tomorrow. I think in terms of they'll be focusing on dev sessions. So, I would say this probably would start next week. You know, and hopefully it wouldn't take. I don't want people to 
spend more than a week on each action items. I mean, people got other things to do, but. Yeah, and my, my goal was, was to have a set of action items that we can then, that people can go off and do. I mean, we were, I knew we weren't going to solve these things, and we're not going to have all the answers. I just wanted to start the conversation. This is going to be something that's going to, and continue on the mailing lists. Um, I just, this is just a problem that I see happening. It's not, we're, we're not stuck today, we, but more and more people are going to have clustering tests, more and more, you know, challenges in terms of data plane. So these, these are the kinds of things. So. Um, I will send this, I will also send this document to the mailing list. Uh, I guess I'll send it to integration. That's probably the right place for it. Uh, so if any of you aren't subscribed and are interested, um, please subscribe to the integration mailing list or look at the archives. You'll find it there too. Um, and uh, continue this discussion because this is, and all the slides, I'll, I'll put, make the slides available as well just to, so people can understand the context for what we're trying to do, the things that Gary's run across with his work uh, with uh, clustering with, with um, Docker. Um, so, uh, I'll just put the action items down here so we have them all in one place. Um, any other things with the remaining two minutes that people wanted to bring up in this context or had ideas or thoughts on? So we're officially 30 seconds over. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess that's all for now. Um, again, I'll make the slides available, this Google document available on the integration mailing list. And, and put, I'll send the slides out, and I'll probably put them up on a wiki somewhere. But um, uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Gary, for the presentation. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, go back to presentation mode here. OK. So there may be some easy things we can do just in terms of how we are running things in terms of tests. Um, that's just one example. Um, and maybe Docker can be used to improve test times. For example, we, we discovered that with uh, the current setup, um, if you're spinning up multiple instances for a test, 
you have to, it, the way the, the API currently works, you have to wait for the first instance to come all the way up before you can then spin up the other instances. So if we can have something where you have a containerized solution, it all comes up in one, one, one VM and you can have these containers that come up with it so you're not, you're not par you can parallelize it within the VM as opposed to waiting you know, serially for the VMs. Um, there may be other things we can do. Uh, there, this, some of this may be moot because there, there were, there's plans to move to node pool, um, but it's still worth, I think, investigating some of these options. Uh, in terms of sophistication, we can also look at using containerized data planes. Um, there may be issues that we need to investigate, I think, with using um, open vSwitch in, with Docker containers on a VM. And, and, the, um, and the data plane tests are usually typically a, a single node with Mininet. And so it's a you know, somewhat limited um, topology. And Mininet has its own limitations about what kind of data path testing you can do. Um, and so you, you know, we ideally like more um, sophistication in terms of, of scaling for clustered uh, set, test setups, more sophistication for what we can test with data plane setups, uh, more control over these kinds of things. And so, that's, so these are some of the things we need to investigate. Um, so in terms of test execution, um, there are some easy things we can do. We can, uh, I was talking with Tan, and he's like, well, you know, one thing, the controller right now has, you know, takes a while to, to, to complete, and that's mainly because you build it, and then through, as part of the build, you're running a lot of these unit tests, and there might be a, a speed up you can have of just the build, or if you could build it first and do that and do the test separately, you can separate these things, and you might actually be able to, to, to have some benefits from that, uh, depending on, like, when a test fails versus when, you know, something in the build fails, relatively speaking. So, oh, apparently I'm, <laughs> here we go. Um, but it's something we need to kind of think about as things moving forward. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, it, maybe Andy can correct me. We have 256 slaves, is that correct? Uh, Okay. And is it 1.5 terabytes? Okay. And we had to bump that up recently because of... So, you know, this is just, just projecting about, you know, what we have today and where we're going. And so, um, you know, we can add more infrastructure, but what's the cost and, you know, what kind of trajectory are we on? So, you know, what can we do? Um, you know, we do some things are perhaps easier than others that we can look at, like we can try and minimize Jenkins jobs by reducing ex ex uh, test execution times. Um, that may, makes it the job queue less because the jobs are taking less and if a bunch of jobs spin up, you know, you, they, they're retiring faster so you don't have as long a queue. And sometimes that's a problem because people are trying to push through commits and they're waiting for a big backlog of jobs to get through, so it's nice to have that, that, that shorter execution times. You can create more scalable tests, um, tests that, you know, are gonna, you know are gonna as you, they mature and you add more sophistication to them that, that's not gonna completely tear down your, your testing infrastructure. Um, you can create a framework for doing more sophisticated test setups. Like it'd be nice to have that where you can have, whether it's, whether it's a Docker container or a Vagrant setup or what it is that you can, that you can, has functionality already in it that you can use. And that, Cause there'll be, I think there'll be commonalities across projects for, for certain testing requirements. And so one of the things, my goal, and I don't think we're going to solve all these today, my goal with this session was to try and, um, try and come up with a list of action items that we can go off and do that, you know, and investigate. Because we have to, I think some of this is going to take some investigation. You know, what can we really do with Docker? What can we do in terms of improving the execution times? What can we do with the test setups that, to improve these things? So that's, that's my, if, it's, if we come out of this session with just some of those action items, I'll, that's, that's, I'll be happy. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar, today's infrastructure, we, um, we, could, we will spin up multiple instances for like clustering tests with JClouds. Um, all right, it's, uh, it's 9.45, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Thomas Bachman, I work for the Noir Networks Group of Cisco. Um, uh, this talk, or this, this session, it's not really a talk, is, is um, exploring use of Docker, Vagrant, and other things um, in open daylight infrastructure. And um, so uh, just as kind of a background, I, I kind of, this, this, this session was kind of selfish in nature for me because, um, you know, we had some needs for testing for our project and then the more I started thinking about it, I realized, well, this is really kind of a lot of projects within Open Daylight are going to have the same problem. So basically the issues are, 
you know, as projects are maturing, the test setups and the requirements are becoming more sophisticated. We have um, clustered data store testing. We have data, more sophisticated data plane validation. Um, we have, you know, it just sort of currently the way we currently do testing it requires more nodes with each node having an incremental cost of RAM and CPUs and stuff. Um, the number of projects in Open Daylight is increasing. I mean, we had 23 in Helium, we have 42 in Lithium, Beryllium, you know, we don't know yet how many projects are 